He is risen. Three small words that brought the collective pace of humanity to an absolute standstill. He is risen. Three words that shattered prisons. Words that shook the earth's foundations. Words that transformed a sense of utter despair into cries of pure joy and ecstasy. Echoes of history's greatest triumph that still shape our reality. Even today, we're assaulted by constant distraction, countless sources waging war for our attention, yet three words pierce the noise. In our hunger for validation, our desperate pleas for love and attention, three words calm our anxieties. In a universe spinning at breakneck speed, its inhabitants locked in an existential crisis, three words proclaim the purpose of our existence. He is risen. Lay hold of this truth and embrace the peace within. Yesterday, fear reigned in our hearts. Yesterday, we sat in crippling darkness. Yesterday, we suffered abuse and all the accusations of a broken world. But today, our king, our healer, our defender is risen. And this reality doesn't merely accompany us on a meaningless journey. This changes everything. For you see, if he is risen, then all other pursuits become secondary. All of our failures become insignificant. All criticisms and condemnations become irrelevant. There is only His word, His mission, and His infinite, unconditional love for you. Because He is risen, we look to tomorrow. Tomorrow we will stop defining our worth through status and social media. Tomorrow we will together build an everlasting kingdom. Tomorrow and every day after, we will dance in the radiance of a redeeming savior who crushed death and set us free. There is nothing that Jesus cannot overcome. We know this because he lives. We know this because he is risen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Well, if you haven't noticed, it's a little bit of a party in here today. Uh, and there's a reason for that. I, for one, believe Jesus is alive, that he's risen. Amen. Amen. And so Easter is a big deal for us, and welcome to the guests and the friends and the family members that are in the room. And normally when we gather, our, my, my sermons and our sermons are really geared at, at the church of how do we become increasingly the church that we believe Jesus wants us to be? How do we share the message of Easter? And it's, it's really directed to help form a people, but really a couple times a year, the focus of our time begins to shift to guests in the room. And so the message this morning is really directed at those who are visiting, who are guests, who are new, uh, because we really want you to understand what we are celebrating this morning, and we hope you are blessed by our time together. And so the idea of Jesus raising from the dead is really big, and Paul kind of lays out for us what's at stake if Jesus was crucified, buried, and did not rise from the grave. Paul would write this. He says, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. Now keep in mind, this is in the Bible. So Paul is basically saying, if Jesus hasn't been raised, all the people's faith who believe in Jesus, their faith is useless. Our testimony is false because we have testified about something that is not true. He continues. He said, 
But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. So we believe that Jesus came to die on the cross to take the punishment we deserved upon himself, but that if he is still dead, we're still in our sins. And he says, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ, that's a euphemism for those who have died believing in Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, have fallen asleep in Christ, are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. He's saying that you should feel sorry for followers of Jesus if in fact what they are doing is just worshiping a dead guy. If we're just gathered singing songs to a dead savior, people should feel sorry for us. But this is the very next verse. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And then quoting from the prophets, he would say this later in the chapter, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? He's saying that there is life in Christ where death has been defeated and that there is hope for us past this life in these bodies because Jesus has risen from the grave. Because if Jesus rose from the grave, everything he says is true and he has conquered death and life is available to us through Christ. So if you're up for it, I would like to read the resurrection story this morning. Does that sound like a fair thing to do on Easter? Okay. It's a simple message this morning, but we're going to be reading from John chapter 20. And uh, if you want to read in your own Bibles or follow along on the screen or just listen, it's completely up to you. But I want to read this narrative to you. John chapter 20, starting in verse 1. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken away the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. Mary was standing outside the tomb, crying. And as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied. And I don't know where they put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go and get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni which is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father, but go find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave them his message. That Sunday evening, 
The disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands. Put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again. And this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. And this is how the chapter ends. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. That is what we are celebrating here at Easter. And if you're new and you're gathering, <laughs> amen, with us this morning, what I want to direct your attention to is to what John, who was one of Jesus' closest friends, who followed him, who served with him, who lived with him, who ministered with him, is telling us about Jesus. He's not merely saying, I want you to believe he exists or to accept him as a good moral teacher. He's really clear on who he wants you to understand Jesus to be. The Messiah, which is the Greek word for the Hebrew one, which word which means anointed one, the son of God. And then he says this, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. So if you go around and you talk with people about Jesus, I mean, scholarship is in, it's really clear. Like Jesus was a historical person. And so almost everybody is like, yes, Jesus existed. And then what you'll find on top of that is, is people generally believe really good things about Jesus. What you'll find is, is even people who have a problem with the church or who maybe have been hurt by the church or, or hurt by a pastor in some way, they still have respect for Jesus. They still look to Jesus. They still have a desire to, to know some things about Jesus and they, they think Jesus's life is beautiful. But, but what you'll find is, is sometimes people will be like, oh, I believe Jesus is a good moral teacher, you know? Um, and here's where I think C.S. Lewis's quote from Mere Christianity, one of his flagship works, I think is helpful. C.S. Lewis says this about the identity of Jesus and the decision that we must make concerning who he is. C.S. Lewis writes, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. And he goes on to explain why. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. 
You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Are you following the logic there? The the idea is this, that there are many people who want to say, look, I think Jesus is a good guy. I think he was a good moral teacher, but I'm not ready to follow him as Lord. And what C.S. Lewis is unpacking here for us is that if Jesus said the sort of things that he said and is not the son of God, then he clearly cannot be a good moral teacher because he's either lying or out of his mind. If someone says they're the son of God and they're not the son of God, you can't be like, I think he's a pretty good guy, you know? So the other options that are laid before us is, well, maybe Jesus is a liar. You know, like a cult leader who goes around professing to be somebody that he's not or she's not and amassing a following for sort of narcissistic reasons or for power or for sexual prowess or whatever these cult leaders are doing their things for. Maybe Jesus is legitimately evil. That's logically option number one. Logically, option number two is that Jesus wasn't intrinsically evil, like he he wasn't trying to start a cult on deceit and lies, but maybe he was cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Like maybe Jesus was out of his ever-loving mind and he really believed things about himself that were not true at all. Or option number three, Jesus is who he says He was. And we believe that all of us need to answer the question of who is Jesus because if his claim to be the son of God is present before us, like that's not just something we should ignore with the rest of our lives, you know? Like that's not a small bit of information and and roughly, and we can debate whether, you know, how many people are following seriously or not, whatever, but roughly one third of the world is saying that is exactly who he is. So we shouldn't ignore this question. And then, you know, Muslims also believe in Jesus and think, and they go with this option that he was a great prophet. So what's interesting is even people of other religions will will nod to Jesus and they're like, "We, we can't deny that he's amazing, but they do deny that he is the son of God who died for the sins of the world and rose from the grave. The thing that C.S. Lewis notes for us though is that that option has not been left open to us. And Jesus did not intend to leave that option open to us. And so my hope and our hope this morning is that people would come to a place where they recognize, where they go with option three, believing Jesus is exactly who he says he is. And then that's not the end That's really the beginning of a journey of following Jesus. And I wanna give you just a sneak peek at what that might look like if in fact you choose that option. We've been in a series on the life of Peter. He was one of Jesus's disciples, one of the inner three, it's been called, of Peter, James, and John, of Jesus's probably closest friends on the planet. And we've been looking at his life. And what's notable is, is the last conversation that we find in the book of John is a conversation between Jesus and Peter. And here's some of that conversation. This is in the account after Jesus has risen from the dead. He's speaking with Peter. And Jesus told him, follow me. And Peter turned around and saw behind them the disciple Jesus loved. That's a reference to John, the author of this account, the one who had leaned over to Jesus during supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? And Peter asked Jesus, what about him, Lord? This is, I think, 
indicative of human nature where we're so kind of concerned with what other people are needing to do or what their discipleship journey is gonna cost them or what is it gonna look like for them to follow Jesus. But there does seem to be some level of uniqueness to each of our journeys in following Jesus. I think there are things that are gonna be true for all of us, but then I think there are gonna be elements of our discipleship journey that are gonna look unique. But I think this part is true for each and every one of us He says this to him. He says, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. We're not concerned about your friends this morning. I mean, we love your friends. We care about them. But there comes a point in time where we need to stop worrying about everyone else. And we do need to make a decision for ourselves. What are we going to do with Jesus? And I think the words that Jesus shared with Peter are words that are resounding across the globe today where Jesus is still inviting, beckoning people to come and to follow him. And so a question that I want to lay before you on this Easter Sunday is have you made that decision to follow Jesus? Have you given your life to him? We don't believe that this is just some stunt that Jesus pulled where he came out of the grave so people could think it was amazing. We believe that in so doing, Jesus defeated death, that there is life for those who would trust in him, that people can be reconciled to God, forgiven of their sins because of the work that Christ did, not only on the cross, but by defeating death, by rising from the grave. And so it does start rather simple. It does start, I believe, with a profession of faith in Jesus. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And then that is the starting point of the rest of our lives of following after Jesus. But do you come in here weary this morning Do you come in here with a guilty conscience, with regret, with fear of the future, with the question of, does God even care about me? Matthew 11, 28, we read this. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. In this moment, I would like us to assume a posture of prayer. And uh, again, the message today was directed at guests, friends, visitors, people who maybe have been coming for a while, checking out this Jesus thing, but have been on the fence and... We believe Jesus is inviting you today to eternal life, to forgiveness of sins, to grace and reconciliation with God. That it's not about what you do. It's not about working your way up to him. It's about what Jesus has already done. So if you're here this morning and you want to cross the line to faith, I want to just use the words of the Bible that says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So there's nothing magical about the prayer that I'm going to lead us in at this moment, but I would just invite you, if this is your heart's desire to give your life to Jesus on this Easter Sunday, to where you're at, just quietly repeat after me, Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I'm trusting in you for the forgiveness of my sins. I believe you are alive, that God raised you from the dead. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. May I follow you the rest of the days of my life. I'm not gonna ask anything else of you. I'm not gonna embarrass you in any way. 
but we do wanna celebrate with you. We do wanna be encouraged. If you prayed that prayer this morning, would you raise your hand right where you're at? Just raise it up high. If you prayed that prayer this morning, if you prayed it for the first time, can we welcome all these hands in the room, ladies and gentlemen, to the community of faith? I want you to know um, that we want to walk with you on your faith journey, uh, that this is a place where you can be at home. If you've traveled here and you're with family for Easter and we can help you connect to a church back home, let us know how we can do that for you. Um, I'm gonna be available after the service to talk. There's gonna be elders also. We have a prayer room right over here. If you have questions about what it means now to follow Jesus, we'd be honored to try and answer those for you. And uh, we wanna be a community of faith that will walk with you on your journey. And uh, I know this might sound fast, but we actually have baptisms, I think, scheduled for next week. So if you want to uh, make, take that next step of publicly declaring your faith in Jesus, uh, we would like to celebrate that with you. But for the rest of us at this time, would we stand for a benediction? This is from the book of Ephesians, and this is how I'm going to dismiss us today, using the words from the Apostle Paul. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. I love you, Edgewater Alliance Church. Happy Easter. Go be the church. Blessings. Blessings.